Good morning. Welcome to worship at Philadelphia Presbyterian Church. At least that's where we are. Welcome to worship wherever you are watching this. I hope you're here live with us, but if not, you can watch it at a later time. And uh, so glad that you have joined us. We just had a, another service in the parking lot at 9 o'clock. That is a great fun service if you want to get out of the house and come uh, get in your car or bring a chair and sit out in front of your car. It's a great way to uh, kick off your Sunday morning. I uh, also encourage you to look at both the children's sermon video and the Kingdom Kids video that you will find on our Facebook webpage, um, YouTube page, all of those pages. Uh, so, and continue to remind you that as we meet virtually like this, to continue to check the COVID-19 webpage uh, on our uh, webpage, the COVID-19 page on our webpage for any updates, uh, any activities that are going on. There is a lot happening at this church, which you will hear about in just a moment. But first, I want to uh, uh, introduce Amy Kaminsky. She is the uh, chair of the Pastor Nominating Committee, and she is coming f before you with a report. So here's Amy. Good morning, everyone. I'm Amy Kaminsky, moderator of the Pastor Nominating Committee. We would like to provide you with a short update. Thank you all for your continued prayers and support of our committee. We are still in the process of meeting at least once a week, reviewing resumes, watching or listening to sermons, and trying to discern who God is calling as the next head of staff at Philadelphia Presbyterian Church. We will continue to provide you with short updates throughout this process, and would just like to thank you all again for your continued prayers and support. Good morning. I have a few announcements for you. As Danny said, we are still very busy here, even though the church building is not open. We have lots of things going on because church is more than a building. And I have an announcement about Backpacks of Love. We are the Backpacks of Love Summer Edition right now, and we are helping families from Bain Elementary and from Clear Creek Elementary. We are in need of some specific items right now. We need canned or single-serving fruit, canned vegetables, and snack packs of crackers or cookies. You know, the smaller things that when parents are saying, yeah, you can have a little bit of sugar, but not a lot of sugar. We need those kinds of snacks right now. And we are doing a feature item each week of something that normally wouldn't go in the backpacks, but we like to do it so that families can have an easy kind of either treat or meal. This week it is uncooked dry spaghetti and spaghetti sauce in a can or a plastic bottle. That is our feature item this week. We also have an opportunity for a hands-on volunteer experience at Bright Blessings. Bright Blessings is allowing volunteers to come in practicing safe social distancing. It is on July 18th, and you would contact Jason Williams. You'll see the email address on the screen right now, or you can contact the church office, or if you check us out on our website or social media page, Facebook, you will see the contact information there. You will bring your own mask, and you can find out the time and details on social media or our website. We also have a book club that started last Wednesday. The book is on why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria. And it is being led this time by Ashley Ponscheck, and I heard it was amazing. And people from our own congregation and the community are involved in that. So if you would like to join in, you can contact Ashley Ponscheck. You can see the contact information on the screen. It is also available on our website. And we are super excited about this. I am so excited I cannot stand it. We are going to have VBS on the go. And you can come here to the church on July 24th 
or July 25th to pick up supplies. No registration is needed, and everyone is welcome. So tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your children. We are doing VBS. It is a five-night program, but you can do it at your own leisure. And more details will be available on the website or on our Facebook page. And also, this week we have our full schedule back. You can see that on Tuesday, I will have a video up and I'll have a special guest um, in answering some fun questions and talking about what it's like to be in this season of the church. And Danny has um, Bible study on, on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. That was a tongue twister. And Shane is back on Thursdays with his hangout. And he is having a snack cake challenge that you don't want to miss. So check out his videos on Thursday. Like I said, we are busy even though the doors of the church are closed. So we hope that you will um, participate in some of the things that we are offering, knowing that God is never, never not in the midst of all that we are going through. And now, my friends, I ask that you would take a moment and breathe in and let it out, and wherever you are, whether you're in your living room or maybe you're sitting at the beach, and just unclutter your mind and your hearts, and let's go to God in prayer and begin worship. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we are so thankful for this opportunity to be together from wherever we are, worshiping you Keep us mindful that this is all about you. That as we lift our hearts in prayer and song and hear your word, may we be focused on all that you are and all that you do. Let us step out of the way so that our eyes might see something new and ears hear a fresh word from you. Break our hearts open for your gospel, God. This is a time in this world where we can be exhausted and confused, but you can lead us through it all. And so during this time, Lord, we ask that we be fully present so that you can lead us and change us and we might come out of this service with a new and fresh anointing that's sent straight from you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our God is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. So let's bring our confessions to God, knowing that God will hear our prayers and forgive. Let us pray. God, who watches over us, we confess it is so easy to be distracted from your truth. Preoccupied with our own comfort, we neglect to stand up for those who suffer. Tempted by what we desire, we fail to protect the earth and respect its limits. In your mercy, give us wisdom to walk in your ways, the will to seek things that truly matter, and the grace to renew relationships with you and with one another. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Apostle Paul reminds us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Our first scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, and I'm reading verses 1 through 9. And this is where Jesus begins to speak to the people in parables, and we realize what a gifted and amazing storyteller Jesus is in his ministry. Hear now God's holy and inspired word. That same day, Jesus went out of the house, and he sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil, and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord lives forever. Thank you. 
Verses 10 through 17, the disciples come to Jesus, ask him, why are you speaking in parables, and ask them what it means. And Jesus goes on and explains this parable. So picking up with verse 18, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So about 10 days ago, the second wave began. Well, maybe that's not the best description I should use because you probably think I'm talking about COVID-19, and I'm not. Unfortunately, we're still mired in the first wave of that. No, what I'm talking about is the second wave of Hamilton. The Broadway musical Hamilton about the life and death of Alexander Hamilton and the founding of our nation. It's been the hottest ticket in town for almost five years now. For a while it was everywhere in the media, but that sort of died down like things do until July 3rd when a filmed version of the original cast musical was released on the Disney streaming service, and suddenly everyone has discovered or rediscovered Hamilton. Hamilton reminds me of the parables of Jesus. It's a story of America then told by America today. It doesn't try to be historically accurate with ornate costuming and staging and actors made up to look like the figures they portray. Instead, it is set to a modern-day rap and hip-hop music sung by people of all manner of races and ethnicities that invites us to look at ourselves today through the lens of history remembered. In the parables, Jesus spoke to the crowds in a language they understood, often using the ordinary and everyday to proclaim the kingdom of God, while at the same time calling people to wake up, listen, and look at what is happening all around. We're in the chapter 13 of Matthew's gospel, and we finally get to a parable. And it's not just any parable either, but the foundational parable, the one that sets the stage for all the others. Remember last week, Jesus has finally seen some opposition, or at least uncertainty and doubt about who he is. He is asked, are you the one we are waiting for, or should we 
wait for someone else. Well, the pushback Jesus receives continues to escalate. Chapter 12 narrates several stories of Jesus' conflict with Pharisees who are now plotting to destroy him and have accused him of working with Satan. By the end of chapter 12, Jesus appears to be at odds even with his own family. And at the end of chapter 13, Jesus will be rejected by his hometown. Why is Jesus encountering so much hostility? Why do so many disregard his message and discredit his ministry? The parable of the sower probes the mystery of mixed responses to Jesus and his message. Jesus teaches from a boat at sea, but his teaching is earthy, using images of seeds and soil. The parable of the sower is unusual in that Jesus offers an allegorical interpretation of it to his disciples. The interpretation focuses on reception of the seed by various kinds of soil as an allegory for varying responses to the word of the kingdom. Now, Jesus' clear explanation of what each element in the parable represents might seem to leave little interpretive work for us, but it also raises some troubling questions. For example, who qualifies as good soil? Since soil cannot change itself, is there any hope for the hardened, rocky, or thorny soil? Are these destined to be unproductive forever? We can find examples of each kind of response to the word in Matthew's gospel. There are many in Matthew's story who hear the word of the kingdom and do not understand, including the religious leaders who are antagonistic to Jesus' ministry from the beginning. The crowds respond positively to Jesus, especially to his miracles of healing yet turn against Jesus at the end and demand his crucifixion, leaving us to wonder whether they ever truly understood. The disciples themselves might be included among those who fall away when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word. And the rich young man, unable to part with his possessions, about whom we'll here later in the gospel, provides a striking example of one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. And what about that good soil? Who are those who hear the word and understand it, who indeed bear fruit and yield an abundant harvest? In Matthew's story, it seems to be the least likely ones. Jesus tells the chief priests and elders, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, the righteous bear fruit by serving the least of these. And even they are surprised to find that they have been serving Jesus. And what about those disciples? Will they ever bear fruit? After several more parables, Jesus asked them, Have you understood all this? And they say, Yes. Yet subsequent events reveal how little they truly understand and how quickly they will desert Jesus just to save their own skins. What is remarkable, though, is that in spite of these failings, Jesus does not give up on the disciples. In fact, he continues to invest in them, even to the point of entrusting the future of his mission to them. Jesus calls Peter the rock upon which he will build his church, even though Peter's understanding of what it means that Jesus is Messiah is confused at best. 
Although Jesus knows full well that all the disciples will desert him and that Peter will deny him, he nevertheless promises them, but after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Jesus does meet them in Galilee. And with all authority in heaven and on earth given to him, turns them loose in the world to carry out his mission. Matthew's story has given us little reason to have confidence in the disciples. Little reason, that is, except for Jesus' promises. Especially significant is Jesus' promise at the very end of the gospel. I am with you always to the end of the age. Which brings us back to the parable. The main char character in the parable, of course, is the sower. I mean, Jesus did say, hear then the parable of the sower. The sower scatters his seed carelessly, recklessly, seemingly wasting much of the seed on ground that holds little promise for a fruitful harvest. Jesus invests in disciples who look similarly unpromising. He squanders his time with tax collectors and sinners, with lepers, the demon-possessed, and all manner of outcasts. Yet he promises that his indiscriminate sowing of the word will produce an abundant harvest. It's not difficult to find contemporary examples of the various responses to the word depicted in Jesus' parable. Having the word choked out by the cares of the world and the lure of wealth seems to be a particular problem in the United States and other developed Western countries. However, we should be very careful to avoid equating the various types of soil with a particular person or group. And we really need to avoid equating ourselves with the good soil. If we're honest, we can probably find evidence of several kinds of soil in our lives and in our congregations on any given day. It is noteworthy that Jesus does not use the parable to exhort hearers to be good soil, as though we could make that happen. If there's any hope for the unproductive soil, it is that the sower keeps sowing, generously, extravagantly, even in the least promising places. Jesus' investment in his disciples shows that he simply will not give up on them in spite of their many failings. We trust that he will not give up on us either, but will keep working on whatever is hardened, rocky, or thorny within and among us. We trust in his promise to be with us to the end of the age. As those entrusted with Jesus' mission today, we might consider the implications of this parable for how we engage in our own service and ministry. Too often we play it safe Sowing the word only where we are confident it will be well received. Only where those who receive it are likely to become contributing members of the congregation, for example. In the name of stewardship, we hold tightly to our resources, wanting to make sure that nothing is wasted. We stifle creativity and energy for mission, resisting new ideas for fear that they might not work as though mistakes or failure were to be avoided at all costs. But Jesus' approach to mission is quite different 
from our play it safe instincts. By using this parable, he is in effect giving us freedom to take risks for the sake of the gospel. He endorses extravagant generosity in sowing the word, even in unpromising places. Though we may wonder about the wisdom or the efficiency of his methods, Jesus promises that the end result will be a bumper crop. In the name of the triune God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, amen. God invites us to be generous with our time, our talents, and our resources so that God's word spreads in the world and bears fruit in each life it touches. And friends, I really feel we have been doing that here at Philadelphia Presbyterian Church. Your gifts of money, but also your gifts of time, your uh, tenacity in staying connected with each other, your talents, they are so welcome and so bountiful. We are so appreciative. I just want to take a moment to remind you of the various ways to give. You can mail your check into the church office. You can drop it off in the mailbox uh, in the driveway of the administration building. You can go to our website and hit the Give portal, and you can send a text and give. Thank you for all that you do. Amen. God is good all the time. We have the opportunity to go to God in prayer. It is a humbling gift that we have been given to be able to join together from wherever we are and pray. We pray for those who are struggling 
we pray for each other. We stand in the gap for those who don't know God, who have lost sight of the goodness of God, who are grieving. And in this time, we join together as one heart and one mind and pray. And so, friends, I ask that you would join together with me during this time and pray. And this morning, I'm going to pause for a moment so that we can lift up those things that we are struggling with and, and just be still and recognize that God is God and God alone, and he can handle what we cannot. And then I will pray, and you be present with God and myself and all of us from wherever you are. Let's pray. God, who created all things from the largest, the most vast sea and sky to the tiniest blade of grass, you thought about every single detail when you created it all. You created each and every one of us and know every hair on our head. And when we hurt, you hurt. When our hearts break, your heart breaks. And when we struggle, you are there to calm the storm. And so in the midst of all that we are going through, God, may we come to you and turn to you and lay our burdens down and leave them there, trusting, knowing, believing that you can handle it because we cannot. This world is in a terrible mess in many places. But if our eyes are open, and reminded of your goodness. There is so much good going on in the midst of it all. And we need to thank you for the goodness. And we need to be courageous enough to let you handle the mess. Our own messiness. The difficult things like COVID-19. And we need to use the tools that you've provided us with in order to fix all of that and to become healthy again. And we need to work together instead of against each other to make healing possible. We need to work together to remember that unity is possible and that you've created each and every one of us vastly different but incredibly beautifully the same. We ask, Lord, that you move through the hospitals and the nursing homes and the houses where people are sick and struggling and touch and leave your fingerprint of healing and hope behind. Be with the nurses and the caregivers and the doctors. Provide them with wisdom and strength for the journey. Be with families who are grieving loss, loss of loved ones, loss of relationship, loss of communication, whatever it is, God. Fill them with a sense of new hope and be light in their darkness. And we celebrate, God, the good things like new babies that have been born, expectant new lives that are coming into the world, vacations and peace and recharged batteries. And remind us that where there is dry soil, we need to water it. Where there is good soil, we need to be mindful of from where it came. And where the seeds have been thrown, we need to tend to them. And we need to remember who you are and where those seeds have come from. Lord, we are so incredibly grateful, most of all, 
for your son Jesus, the one who told the parables and the stories and preached and taught and did all these things without judgment. It's in his name we pray. Amen. This week in the Kingdom Kids message, I get more out of those, I think, than I ever conceived possible. They talk about recharging your batteries. And I was on vacation last week, and for any of us, I think vacations are very different this year. And mine was a staycation, and I thought, this is not much different than I've been doing for the past four months. But it really was, because I went fishing and did different things that I normally haven't done in a really long time. And I went fishing, and I caught a shoe. (laughs) Um, But it was the best time because I went with a friend, and we laughed, and we did some relaxing things that day, like just didn't talk about what's on the news, and we just talked about fun things. I encourage you this week, go and do something And don't talk about what's on the news. Talk about the Lord. Talk about a book. Talk about Hamilton. But have a good time doing absolutely nothing but enjoying the creation that God made just for us all the way down to a blade of grass. I hope that you have a wonderful week. And I hope that you recognize how good God is in the midst of everything that's going on. I'll see you next week. Many modern interpretations of today's parable focus on the soils as if that was the focus of the parable. It kind of goes like this. You better be good soil. You don't want to be rocky soil or thorny soil. You better become good soil because that's what Jesus asks of us. And sure, that makes some sense, but... Jesus himself said, hear the parable of the sower. This parable is about God, not us. And God is the sower that generously sows the word 
Jesus everywhere. For God so loved the world. Friends, as you go about your week, remember that the sower has already sowed for us and has not cared one bit where that seed falls. And we, as imitators of Jesus, need to do the same. So go in peace, my friends, in the name of the one who is and who was and who is to come. Amen.